Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today's topic is land records, and it's an introduction to land records, so we're going to be talking at a really basic level. For those of you who have um, never thought about using land records before, we'll talk about why we're going, why we would want to use them. Um, for those of you who don't, um, haven't actually dug into land records, we're going to talk about all of the different types of land records pretty briefly, and then um, I'm going to give you some homework which I don't do very often, but I think it would be a useful exercise for you um, to go through a few of the things that I'm going to talk about just to educate yourself and familiarize yourself a little bit. Um, one of the challenges of genealogy is that oftentimes we get so excited about finding the records and using the latest and greatest technology to dive into searching that we sometimes forget that we need to educate ourselves a little bit better about time and place and record type um, so that we can get the most out of the records. So that when we find a record it has meaning and it has value and we can extract every last piece of information out of it that will help us move our family history um, back further and deepen some of those stories. So without much of an introduction, let's dive into today's topic. Really, this could be um, a, you know, a week-long class, several hours a day, but um, like I said, this is just an introduction to land records, and so it's going to be pr a pretty basic overview. As always, I'll be available on chat afterwards if you're watching this live and have any questions, and then maybe if you have um, questions, if I see a lot of questions that are similar in the coming weeks, we can do a little bit more advanced class. So here are just some of the reasons for why we use land records in family history. The first one is to tie people to a specific place and time. Now that may seem um, fairly elementary to some of you, but um, we use we use census records for that same purpose, to tie people to a specific place and time. Uh, sometimes those census records aren't available. Land records um, go back much further than the census. And for those of you who are um, who are familiar with the 1850 census, which is the first census that lists every member of the household, sometimes those land records before 1850 or even around that time period can help us reconstruct some of those families in ways that we might not be able to otherwise. And so tying people to a specific place and time is really important. One of the other things that land records can do for us is help to sort out people of the same name. So I was just talking to um, a girlfriend of mine a couple of days ago. Maybe that was just yesterday. <laughs> the days start to run together. Um, and she was talking about how she's found this man in her family history, in her ancestry, and she thinks, just looking at the records, that people have taken two men of the same name and combined them, combined their wives and combined their children, and that there really are two men, not one, and so we were talking about ways she could sort that out. Well, land records are one of the ways that you can sort that out. Um, as you start to see um, who owned property and where that property went and where it came from, you can start to make some of those um, divisions between sometimes the, the confusion that occurs when you have people with the same name in the same place. Even names that aren't terribly common sometimes end up being repeated in families. Um, the third thing that you can do with land records or why you might want to use land records is to help establish kinship ties. Kinship's a big scary word <laughs> so for some of you, but really it's just about establishing relationships um, and not just familial relationships. Sometimes it's about understanding the community a little bit better so that you can understand your ancestor better. Um, people that married into the family, people that they did business with, people that they worshipped with, all of that helps you to, to not just tell the story of your ancestor, but also helps to further your research, to continue to make those relationship connections. Um, and then the final reason that I have here is just so that you can better understand not just the geography of the time, but also your ancestors. Um, a lot of times we'll look at a map and boundary lines, um, you know, when you start thinking about counties and states, boundary lines are fairly arbitrary. Um, if your ancestor lived in a place and you can understand more about that place, then you can understand why they may have gone to another county to get married as opposed to getting married in their own county. Or you may understand why they migrated from one place to another when you start to understand that the place they were living was on the side of a, a rocky hill and not great for farming or whatever, right? So, so land records help you to understand um, and, and make some of the, draw some of those conclusions about who your ancestors were and why they may have done some of the things that they did. 
So those are just four reasons I came up with. I'm sure there are other reasons, but those are the ones that, um, that mean the most to me. Now, let's just talk really briefly, and I'm going to run through this really long list of 10 things really quickly of the different kinds of land records. Um, and I won't go into detail on each of them. Again, this is just an introduction to kind of introduce you to, um, to land records, also to kind of broaden your um, vision of what is possible or what's available. So uh, the first kind of land record is um, a deed, which is just property transferring from one person or one group of people to another. And so it will list oftentimes the names of all parties, and sometimes it will list the relationships of those parties, um, as well as information about the transaction itself. Land grants, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about those in just a minute, but land grants um, are a type of land record. Homestead applications, and a lot of this country was um, settled by homesteading. Plat maps, and we talked about those a few weeks ago in, um, in a class that I taught about place and using maps to understand place. So we won't spend a lot of time on that. We'll look just briefly at those today. Um, bounty land warrants. We'll look at some of those today. Um, land that was granted to uh, men for military service specifically. Uh, survey systems private land claims, estate records. I love estate records. <laughs> um, when you can find them, they're often gold mines of information. Probate records. So when somebody dies, how is their property distributed? And then tax records are actually a type of land record as well. Now you'll notice that some of these records may overlap with other record types, right? Plat maps are land records and maps. Tax records are land could be land records and taxes. Probate records are land records and um, court records. So some of the record types overlap, but again, this is just to broaden your ideas about where you might find information about property owned by your ancestor, the transfer of that property back and forth, um, how they acquired it, um, all of that. And again, remember, you're trying to tie people to a place in time. You're trying to establish some kins kinship connections, sort out people of similar names, and learn more about the geography. So. Um, how are we going to get into your into the land records? Here is your homework, and I hope that you're taking some notes because I'm going to walk you through each of these steps, but I want you to actually go and do this <laughs> um, just to, to familiarize yourself with um, some of these resources available to you. So the first resource available to you is the Ancestry Wiki. If you're not familiar with the wiki, it is um, just a, uh, well, we, we originally populated it with the books, The Source and The Red Book. The Red Book is a list of um, counties by county resources available by county in the United States. And the source is kind of like the Bible of genealogy. Um, so you're going to find both of these in our wiki, which if you hover over the Learning Center, it's going to be the bottom option on there, this Family History Wiki. And you'll see here you can go directly to the source or the Red Book, which just um, provide information about locational, um, locality-based resources, or the source, which is this guidebook to American genealogy. And I would encourage you to explore those. For our purposes today, I'm actually going to have you have, type in a very specific phrase, overview of land records. There's an article, um, or a chapter actually, I believe, in the source um, that is all about land records. So you'll see it comes up here as this first link when I do that search. So here's this article. It's really brief. I would encourage you to read it just so that you can get familiar again with land records. But then over here, you're going to see links to the rest of the articles in that chapter of the book. And so you'll, you can learn about deeds. You can learn about um, specific states that are called state land states and how they distribute property, um, survey systems. Um, how to how to read a plat map, how to understand and create plats, um, public domain states, which are different than state land states, and it's help, helpful to know the difference between the two because that might make a difference in how your ancestor acquired or um, distributed their property. 
Certainly, um, if you have family that came west, you're going to want to learn something about the Homestead Act and how that affected it. Um, if you have ancestors who served in the military, or if you come across their name in a bounty land warrant, you might want to understand more about um, how the military disseminated property. Um, taxes, we mentioned that briefly, you can learn about that. Um, English law comes into play a lot, especially the further back you go um, in U.S. history and even before we were a country. Country, that law makes a big difference in how property can be inherited, how property can be, um, s how property transactions can take place, um, all of that. And so understanding a little bit of that becomes helpful. And then we've got a list uh, of links and other resources if you have more, if you want more information. So that's the first thing that I would encourage you to do is just to go into the Ancestry Wiki, type in again in the search box, Overview of Land Records, read that introductory brief little three pair three or four paragraph article and then look at those links and see if any of those things are of interest to you and learn a little bit more about them the next um, thing that i would like you to do in the wiki is to actually type in the name of your state and then the word land records because every state has things are a little bit different so for example if i was interested in north carolina land records i would just type that here and you'll see it takes me directly to an article, this one from the Red Book, remember these are locality-based resources, where it talks about whether or not North Carolina is a state land state or, or um, not. It talks about um, how property through time was granted or um, recorded, where you're going to find the land records for a particular place. Um, in this case, you'll notice a whole set of um, land records, grants, and papers have been indexed um, by the North Carolina State Archives, and you can access that directly on their website. Keep in mind that's just a an index, because then you have to go find the original packet sometimes of papers that that index represents to get more information and oftentimes you can get that directly from the North Carolina State Archives or from other organizations that might have microfilmed that and have that available. So pick a state, whatever your state is that you're most interested in and um, type in the name of the state and the phrase land records and just again just read you'll notice these articles aren't long <laughs> but they'll provide you with just enough information I think to start to understand where it is that you're going to find the records that you need, what it is that's even available, um, how far back some of these records go, which for those of us who understand some of the challenges of doing early 1800s and late 1700s research, um, land records become a lifesaver to us because they are some of the only records that still survive um, or that were ever even kept that might provide us with the information we need about our ancestors. So those are your first two pieces of homework. <laughs> Ancestry Wiki, Overview of Land Records, and then State Land Records for your state of interest. Now let's actually look at what LandRecordsAncestry.com has available for you online. So what I would encourage you to do, and we'll do it here together, but you might want to try it on your own as well, is to explore the card catalog. If you're new with us, um, you may not have heard me speak about the card catalog before. Um, here's how this works, just briefly. Um, most people spend a lot of time searching on Ancestry, doing manual searches, or using their family tree and following those hints, those little leaves. Um, Ancestry also has a card catalog. You're going to find it under search, it's the very bottom option there, card catalog. And it's a listing by database of the 30,000 at this moment, 747 databases that Ancestry.com has online. You'll notice each database can have millions of records. So when you're doing just a general search, you're searching all of those databases. And sometimes you don't get to, um, as you um, go through census records and some of the more popular or prevalent records that rank a little higher, sometimes you don't get to some of the more obscure records that might be in smaller collections, but that might actually hold the record that you're looking for for your ancestor. So the card catalog is a good way to just see what's available and to search database, database by database to see what records might exist about your ancestor. So what we're going to do is we're going to click on, if you just scroll down just a little bit here on the filters, we're going to click on tax, criminal, land, and wills. We've lumped all of those together in a single large category. 
Um, and so we're going to click on that, and then you'll see it breaks it down into smaller categories here. So we're going to click on land records for the purposes of our exercise here. And you'll notice that Ancestry.com has 318 databases that contain land records, or what we've classified specifically as land records. You can then further filter this list by geography, or by um, century, or by decade, it's up to you. But um, for, for the purposes of this exercise, let's just look at some of these most popular. This list always default sorts by popularity. You can change that to sort it alphabetically, or to see what's new, or what's the biggest, whatever. Um, it's up to you. But let's just take a look at a couple of these databases. The first one is this county land ownership map. So we're going to look at this briefly. Like I mentioned, we talked about this a few weeks ago in um, an episode that I did about place and using place um, to help with your research. So these um, county land ownership maps, uh, are you can browse them which means they have images attached. So you can browse directly um, if you have a state of interest. Let's see, where do, sometimes I can alphabetize Kentucky. Um, and then we're going to look at Bracken and Pendleton counties. So you can come in here and you can see that this is a microfilm that, that we digitized. And you can then go image by image through it, just like you would a reel of microfilm, to get a feel for what's available and what's not available and what information it contains. Or you can just jump directly to a particular image. And you'll notice that let me actually go to this image. These, um, these maps, these county land ownership maps, and make this bigger, fit width, there we go. You'll notice they have people's names on them. And that is um, the property or the location of the property for these people in that particular town or portion of this particular county. And so it's really helpful because, again, it helps you to start to understand the geography. It helps you to start to understand the relationships as you see who lived near them, who lived around them. Um, if you can find maps, like this one is for 1884. If I could find a map for five years earlier or five years later or something like that, you could see how the property changed over time. And sometimes what you'll see is like a single property owner's property will get divided into three or four sections. And you know, if two of those people have the same last name and one doesn't, it's possible that those are two sons and a son-in-law. And so those are the kinds of things that, the kind of clues that you can get from these land ownership maps as you start to dig into them and investigate them a little bit. Really great resource. Um, I did mention that we were going to talk about um, bounty land warrants, which are military um, property that's deeded for military service. And so we have, um, one of the databases we have here is the Revolutionary War Pension and Bounty Land Warrant Applications. Now, I say this a lot, and I'm just going to reiterate this here because this is a great place to do that. When you get to a database that you are interested in, it's really tempting to just start filling in these empty boxes. <laughs> they just beg to be filled in and you know you want to find your ancestor so desperately. But I would encourage you really strongly to do a couple of things first. The first thing I would do is scroll down past that search box and read what we call our database description. We provide you with a source, uh, a set of source information, which tells you where Ancestry.com got this information. So in this case, it came from NARA, or the National Archives um, of the United States, uh, from their Department of Veteran Affairs um, records. And it was this series of microfilm rolls that was digitized and put online. So that's the source information. Below that, you're going to see information about exactly what's in the records. And we provide you, we try to provide you with information that will help you understand and use these records to the, to the best possible use, to get the most out of them. So you see here we've provided you with a brief description about bounty land warrants, and then information about how to use these records and what some of the things you're going to see might mean. So I would always recommend that when you go to a specific database, scroll down past that search box and read that database description. The second thing, and, and you don't have to do this with all collections, but this is one of those collections where it's really useful, is to maybe browse 
just a little bit again before you start searching. Um, for those of us who have been browsing the 1940 census, we've, we've relearned the importance of this. When you browse a record collection as opposed to just searching it and going straight to a record, you get context. You, you tend to look more at the street names and the neighbors and um, you know the occupations and it just it changes the way that you look at the record. It also I think enhances sometimes the meaning of that record. So um, I would encourage you occasionally to just browse through a collection of records. We provide browse here um, where there are images and the browse is different for every set of records. So for example, this one is done by surname because that's how the National Archives microfilmed it. So what you're doing is you're just going to a specific reel of microfilm and basically looking at it like you would a reel of microfilm. Um, with the censuses, it's broken down by state and then by county and then by enumeration district. With passenger lists, it's broken down by by year and then by date and then by ship name. So there, the browse is a little bit different with every collection, but you can see that it can take you to a very specific set of records. Now, um, let me make this fit so you can see what I'm talking about here. So this is um, this particular reel of microfilm that was done by the National Archives. It has 896 images. Now remember, you're browsing to get context not specifically to look for your ancestor. And what you're going to notice as I start to um, go through these first few pages is that the National Archives has provided at the beginning of each of these reels of microfilm um, a very detailed explanation of exactly how Revolutionary War Pension and Bounty Land Warrant application files work. Why they were issued, what, I mean, more information than we could have provided in the database description. And so you'll see they have these great articles written by people who are intimately connected and, and associated with these records that, that will help you understand exactly what it is that you found exactly what it is that you can do next with these records. And I think if I remember correctly that this particular article goes on for 12 or 13 pages before it actually gets into the records themselves. Talks about the value of the record. This section is talking about related records. So if you find this, you find your ancestor in this collection, what do you do next? What other records might have more information? And then it starts with the files. And you'll notice that these are files that have been microfilmed. It's a file folder. You can see the, the imprint here of the paper clips that were put on it. Sometimes they're little cards and then papers after it that have been that have been clipped together or connected. And so then you just start going through them. So even once you find your ancestor in this collection, um, so for example, let's go to George, ba oh, caps lock George Barry, and um, he was from Kentucky. So this is one of my great, 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 great grandfathers. Um, when I click on that, when I get to the record for him, remember, scroll through the images because that's just the first page. There are more records about him. Here we go. Um, and sometimes there can be 30 or 40 pages. Sometimes there's just two or three pages. It just depends. And so then you'll want to read through these documents to see exactly, you know, what land is he getting? Where is he being deeded it? What was his service? Um, oh, I love these records. These are just phenomenal, phenomenal records. Okay, we never have enough time. We're almost out of time, and I have two more things that I want to talk to you about. So um, you'll notice here we have land grant records, and we have them for several states. Here's just in this popularity sorted list here. I can see Kentucky, Alabama, Pennsylvania, Ohio, right? Lots of different states here. So let's just take a look at Kentucky really quickly. Um, what you're going to discover is that these particular records are um, oftentimes just an index, which you would know if you um, if you read this, right? So the source information here tells us that it, this looks like it came from a book, um, actually a series of books, volume one and two of Kentucky Land Grant Grants published in 1925 by this person. So what we've done is we have just digitized the information um, in the book or created an index out of the information in the book. So you'll notice no image here to click on. This is all that's contained. Um, and so you could go and find a copy of this book and see if it's maybe it's on Google Books or it's been digitized and is available online or maybe you can get it through interlibrary loan um, through your library. But you might want to go check out the original book and see if there's more information. 
Or you'll notice here this is a, a Lincoln County record out of Kentucky. Maybe you contact the Lincoln County Courthouse and see who holds their land grants or their land records for this time period. It might be them. They might still have them in the courthouse. Um, they might have been turned over to a local archive or historical society. So sometimes it's just an index of information and you need to know what to do, to, to where to go next. Often we try to provide you with that information there in the either the source description or right there on the index page. Okay. Um, the other thing you can do is you can type in um, words like deeds and see what um, information comes up in the card catalog. So, for example, um, I'm looking for the one I looked at earlier today and I don't see it. So let's just look at Livingston County, Missouri. Again, this is going to be just an index. And, but you're going to get a little bit more information. And so read through it. Again, you're connecting people to one another. You're connecting them to time and place, and you're connecting them to, to the geography or the, the dispensation of the property or the taxes of the property. Um, that's what all of these records are about. Okay, last thing um, is just a reminder of what we just talked about, which is um, don't just search, also browse, do both. <laughs> Read those database descriptions. Um, if you can browse to the beginning of a reel of microfilm, do that. Oftentimes the archives, particularly the National Archives, they're really good about providing as much information as they can so that you can learn. Now, um, as I said, this was just an introduction. <laughs> So the purpose was to get you familiar with why you want, might want to use land records, what, um, where, what kinds of land records exist, and just a way to get started looking into them. If you have more specific questions about land records, you have a couple of options. First, I will be on chat immediately following this presentation if you're watching it live, and I am happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, and if you're watching this in an archived version, please send me an email at ask at ancestry.com. Now, I won't, I won't necessarily answer your specific question, but what I will do is collect all of those emails as they come in, and maybe we can have a follow-up presentation where we dive more specifically into a specific kind of record type, maybe even do some lookups for two or three of you to give you an idea of how it works, what you'll find, and what to read on some of those records. So if you have more questions after doing your homework, <laughs> then feel free to email me and I'll take a look at that. That also goes for if you have other questions or other topics about family history research, genealogy, ancestry.com, and our website, just email those questions to me. I use those questions to put together our um, live presentations each week on Tuesday and Thursday mornings and um, so I'd love to hear from you and hear what challenges you're facing. You can check the Ancestry.com Facebook page, click on that events tab to see the um, times for future presentations and, and what the topics are if you're going to be interested in them and I hope you'll find something that interests you and you'll join us. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.